Good morning. Good to see everybody Happy this Sunday. morning. Happy Sunday. Amen. Happy Lord's Day. Y'all believe Thanksgiving's right around the corner? And pretty soon we're going to be celebrating Christmas, right? Wow, this year has truly passed by. You know, uh, the Lord's word is so true when it says our life is but a vapor. Amen. Let that, let that, let's just meditate on that a little bit. You know what that does is that humbles us. Amen. Our life is but a vapor. We're here today and gone tomorrow. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto men, once to die, and after this the judgment. That's it, right? And only the things that are done for Christ will last. Yeah. Everything else is going to burn up. Right? Imagine, imagine uh, like a factory that has a conveyor belt. And all of these products and all of these things are going through the conveyor belt. And there's a fire. And only the things that are precious towards the end of that fire are going to come out. Everything else, the wood, hay, stubble, as the Bible says, it's all going to get burned up, right? And, and the reason why I mention that is because oftentimes our focus is so much on the temporal. Morning, Lupita. Good to see you. It's so much on the temporal, so much on our possessions here upon this earth, right? But uh, let's not lay up for ourselves treasures on earth where Jesus says we're mocked and rust doth corrupt and destroy, and where thieves break through and steal. But let us lay up treasures in heaven. Amen? Now that's, that's not only uh, a message about giving, right? That's also a message about giving of yourself for the Lord's work. Yes. Right? He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust of corrupt and destroy and where thieves, praise God, cannot break in and steal. Can you imagine what a day that will be? When our Jesus we shall see. Amen. <laughs> well, week one, as we've been studying the life of the Apostle Paul, it's been a tremendous blessing. As Brother Dan mentioned earlier, it's a lot of content. It's heavy. Amen. So, Brother Dan and I uh, need to be led of the Spirit to have some wisdom for us to kind of condense it down a little bit because we don't want to make anyone fall asleep, right? We want to give you the nuggets and we want to give you the uh, the truth of the, of, the, of the messages, but we don't want to bore you, if you will, and give you too much. Uh, week number one, if you weren't here, we studied Paul, the persecutor turned preacher. Uh, second week, we taught on Paul's preparation, how God had prepared him to be able to go out and and to do the ministry, equipped him for the ministry. Last week, Brother Dan, I appreciate your prayers, by the way. Last week, I woke up with a tremendous migraine. Mm. And uh, I don't know if my body just needed extra rest or what. But um, thank you for praying for us. I ended up waking up. I told Sister Carrie as we came uh, at night. And we, we spent the, the night with the, with the kids there. That we felt a lot better. So thank you for that. Last week, uh, Brother Dan taught on Paul the preacher. I heard that went well. And this week, we're going to talk about Paul the pastor. Paul the pastor. Now, this is a controversial topic because there's a lot of pastors and there's a lot of people that will say Paul was not a pastor because he was never married. Now, now I don't want you to, don't listen to what I say. Listen to what Pastor Hetzer says because he's your pastor. And whatever he says, amen, just please listen to that or... You know, ask the Lord what you think about this subject. But I personally think that the Apostle Paul was a not only a pastor, but he was a pastor's pastor. He had he had a pastor's heart like no other. Amen. You know, he called uh, Timothy his own son in the faith, and that's that's not only because he led him to Christ. You see, the Apostle Paul wasn't the type of person that would go and lead someone to Christ and just leave them on the side of the road. The Apostle Paul would go and invest in that person, and disciple that person, and baptize that person. And, and, and he would, as much as possible, try to communicate and show love and encourage and love on that person. Y'all remember the same thing in Titus. When uh, the Apostle Paul was writing a, the, the letter there to Titus, look with me, if you will, at, uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, look at Titus chapter 1, then we'll get into our message here. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, look at Titus chapter 1 real quick. 
The Bible says this, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, verse 1, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in the hope of eternal life. I love this part. Which God that cannot lie. Mm -hmm. You see, if God is promising you eternal life class, where are you going to go when you die? Eternity. Eternity, heaven. You're going to spend eternity in heaven with him. Why? Because God cannot what? Lie. Hey, praise God for that. There's something God cannot do. You don't lie at all. And it's not that it's not that he 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 won't lie, it's that he cannot lie. Why? Because he's perfect. He's the truth. I am the way, the truth. And the life, amen. He cannot lie. Praise God for that. He's the amen. Promised, and I love this part. He promised before the world began. He promised you eternal life before the world even began. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now look at verse 4. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. He echoes the words here to Timothy in verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Now these aren't his actual children, biologically speaking. These are spiritually speaking, the ones that he led to Christ. And he was as a father unto them. Now... The Bible says this in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. The Lord speaking says, And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. You see, it's God that gives you pastors according to his heart to bless you, to be a blessing unto your life. Amen. Now, the Lord had to rebuke some so-called pastors. Look at uh, really quick here before we jump into our message. Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah, chapter number 23. Jeremiah 23. Look what the Bible says in verse 1. Everybody there say amen. amen. Y'all awake this morning? Yes. Amen. I had a couple cups of coffee, so I'm ready to go. Yeah. Jeremiah 23, look at verse 1. The first word of this verse says, woe. Now this is, this is like, wow, woe. Woe be unto the who? Pastors, pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, exclamation point, saith who? The, the Lord. Lord. The Lord is speaking here, right? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. So what's the job of a pastor? Feed, the feed, the feed them what? Feed them the lamb and, and kebabs and the <laughs> truth. The word. Feed them the word of yeah. God. You see, uh, Jesus said this in Matthew 4, 4. Man shall not live off bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen? Um, the job of a pastor or an elder or a bishop is to feed the flock of God. Look with me, if you will, at 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Peter... Now, as he's writing this epistle, has become elder. He has more wisdom in his, he's, he's, a, he's older, he's more wise, if you will. He's learned some things. He denied the Lord Jesus. He learned from it. He repented. Now he's all in for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes this in 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. <laughs> the elders which are among you, I exhort. The elders are basically the bishops or the pastors, if you will. He says, Whom, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also the partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you. What is he, what is he exhorting or encouraging or challenging the pastors to do? Feed the flock of God. Don't talk about politics. Don't talk about what's going on in the world. Amen. All that, listen, okay, we can talk about that, but give back. Feed me the word of God. Amen? Amen? Feed me the word. He says, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint. You know what that means? Don't shove the Bible down people's throats. Mm -hmm. And that's, see, all of this leads back to our study here about the Apostle Paul. He never did that. The Bible says that he, when, he, when he talked about the word of God, he did it with tears. He was, he was, he was trying to, as much <laughs> as possible, 
trying to really uh, change people's minds on the things of the world and trying to get them saved. I was pleading with people and begging people with tears, please give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a pastor. He had a pastor's heart. And Peter says this, he says, he says, not by constraint, but willingly. And I love this part, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. You know what he's saying? Don't do it for money. There's a lot of so-called pastors out there they're in it for the money. And if the money's gone, guess what? They're gone. <laughs> yeah. you, know what, you know what Jesus says? He says, woe unto those. Yeah. Right? Woe unto those. You know, Jesus, when they came to him and they said, should we pay a tribute? Should we pay our taxes? Jesus borrowed a coin from an individual. And he lifted up that coin and he says, whose inscription is on this? They said, Caesar. He said, render to Caesars the things that are Caesars, but render to God the things that are God's. You know, Jesus didn't have any money in his pocket. He had to borrow some money to make that illustration there. The point I'm trying to make is this. The pastor's job is to feed the flock willingly, wholeheartedly, to be a blessing and encouragement, to love and to guide and to disciple and to pour into, to encourage. Amen? Amen. All those things, as I studied the Apostle Paul's life, I saw. All those amazing attributes was, was the Apostle Paul. Look with me, if you will, at our text, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We're going to read about 15 verses is what they have here. Acts chapter 20, verse 17 through 32. The Bible says this. It's in your outline. I think it is. Yeah. yeah. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church. So the Apostle Paul is calling the elders, the pastors of the churches, the elders, the ones who are basically in charge of the flock. And he's going to encourage them. He's going to talk to them here. And he says in verse 18, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been, uh, with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and here's here's the key, and with many tears. Why? Because he knows that Satan's all over the place trying to cause division amongst the churches. Right? He says, and temptations which befall me by uh, by the lying and weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. But I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I, life, count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. It's probably another reason why he's crying. He's not going to see the brethren anymore. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore. This is a, a good charge to the pastors. He's saying in verse 28, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. I love this part, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day again with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. So what's able to build you up? The word, the word, amen. And to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So the Apostle Paul gathers these elders together. And he, he challenges them to feed the flock of God. Amen. Over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Listen, he's reminding them that God has put you in this position 
And it's a big position. It's a high calling as the, Bible, as the Apostle Paul calls it. It's a high calling. So feed the flock of God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, as Peter was exhorting the elders there, he said, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall give you a crown of glory which shall not fade away. He's saying, just keep doing it. Just stay in the race, amen? I love how the Apostle Paul says, Neither do I count my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. You know what he's saying? He's saying, whatever happens to me happens, but as long as I can be a blessing unto you all, as long as we can, we can, we can move the church forward and grow and bless the heart of the Lord Jesus, I don't care what happens to me. He mentioned that he was going to go bound into Jerusalem and he didn't know the things that were going to happen to him. He didn't know if he was going to see any of his brethren anymore. But listen, you know what he was doing? He was pouring his heart unto these other pastors. He was loving on them. He was challenging them. He was, he was, he was encouraging them for them to go out and to be a blessing unto all the flocks that, that they have an oversight of. An introduction here. Paul was a wonderful example of a missionary, church-planting pastor. His ministry carried from Damascus to Jerusalem to Rome and touched many, many points in between. As he founded churches and trained pastors, he was, as we saw in our previous lesson, faithful to preach the word. In this way, he was used by God to see people saved and discipled. He continued his pastoral care over the churches that he planted, both of the congregation and also of their pastors. Paul was not only a pastor, he was a pastor's pastor. Now, earlier I mentioned that this is a controversial subject. There are many uh, preachers and pastors that I know that today that will say that the Apostle Paul was not a pastor because he was not married. You say, where are they getting that doctrine from? Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, you could, you could judge for yourselves whether he was a pastor or not. I do believe that he was. 1 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is giving, uh, he's giving certain direction and certain, uh, um, how can I say, he was giving certain principles unto Timothy as he was a young pastor, as Timothy was going to set up a uh, uh, elders in the churches, he was challenging him on those that were going to be coming up and becoming pastors and getting ordained. They needed to have certain criteria. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, a bishop is also an elder or a pastor, he desires the good work. So if God has put in a heart of a man to be able to you know, feed the flock, to be able to become a pastor... The Bible says this is a good work. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless. Now here's the key, the husband of one wife. Now, there are certain people that will take that and they will say, see, a pastor has to be married because the Bible says a husband of one wife. Now I take that and I see that as he cannot have multiple wives. Yeah. Amen? Amen. And then there are others that would argue and say, well, if he's not married, he's not going to have children. He's not going to know how to give counsel unto the young, unto the children, right? Or unto, unto the, those who are married. He's not going to know how to, how to uh, teach them or disciple them in those areas because he doesn't have experience. I believe this with all my heart, my brothers and sisters. The wisdom comes from above. That's right. The wisdom comes from above. And gets poured into that pastor during this quiet time in the word of God. And then that man of God is giving it unto the people. Mm -hmm. Now, there are so much that I've learned when I got married. When I had children. Amen. I can definitely relate more, if you will, to those who are married now that I'm married. And it's a tremendous blessing to be married. And it's a tremendous blessing to have children. But there are those that say that Paul was never a pastor. Mm -hmm. But again, I do believe he was a pastor. I believe he was just mentioning, just don't be married to multiple women. Y'all remember what happened to Solomon? <laughs> you know, I, I truly believe Solomon had a shaved head like myself. I believe he was bald. You say, why? Because I think he ended up pulling all of his hair out of his head. <laughs> I think he went crazy, amen? And it wasn't women. Women, please don't take me wrong on that. It wasn't because of the women. It was because of his poor choices that he made. <laughs> amen? 
uh, he ended up going mad. But anyways, you can read Ecclesiastes and praise God that he ended up repenting. And we will see him one day in heaven. Your first fill in the blank is Paul had a pastor's head. Wow, we're already 20 minutes in and I've only given you the first fill in the blank. So I'm, I'm going to go by these uh, pretty quickly here. Paul had a pastor's head or a pastor's mind. He wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians 127, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the, of the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together in the faith of the gospel. Paul not only had his mind on right, his head on right, he wanted others to have the same mindset, the same mindset of doctrine, the same mindset of uh, dealing with sin, the same mindset of loving the Word of God, of living a holy life. Paul had his mind on right. Amen. He had his head on right. Let me give you A, you're filling the blank. A, he wanted his people to stand together. Brother Dan, I appreciate you flipping the, the slides there. He wanted his people to stand get, together. That's a very, very important thing that a pastor should want unity within the body of Christ. Amen. Uh, Paul emphasized continually the need for Christian believers to stand together. In Acts chapter 20, Paul made it clear to the Ephesian church elders that had been willing to stand for the Lord that uh, he desired them to stand with him, however far apart physically that they might be. Uh, Paul warned the Roman believers of the dangers of disunity. In Romans 16, verses 17 through 18, Paul said this, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions mm -hmm. and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. So, uh, I've, you know, over my years, I, I got saved, most of you know, uh, during Y2K in 2000, so I've been saved now for 23 years. And over the past 23 years, I've been to many churches and I've seen some things. Um, but uh, I've seen a lot of people that'll put down the pastor, put down the staff, and, and gossip, and kind of be, be those that like to whisper in others' ears, hey, Brother Gilbert, have you, have you noticed what uh, so-and-so's been doing lately? You know, or pastor has been doing this lately. What is that person doing? They're trying to cause divisions on what's the church. It's a division right there. Right? You get it right in there. Right. So what is Paul doing here? Paul is warning the people that are over the flock against those. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, I want you to avoid them. Those who cause divisions. By the way, what, what, is, what, is, what is Satan's main purpose in his life? To steal kill and destroy now what's causing division that's destroying a family that's destroying a church right if someone were to call my wife and constantly put in her ear oh you're, you don't know what your husband's been doing or you know you should leave him what is that person doing trying to cause division yeah. now imagine sister brenda gets on the phone and she says sister norm your husband is messed up but love on him Pray for him. Fast, fast for him. I am messed up. Amen. Please, please, please love on him and show him, show him the light of Jesus. What is she doing? She's being a peacemaker and she's trying to cause unity. Why? Because there are children in the family, right? And 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 listen, when a family breaks up or when a church breaks up, there's all kinds of sin that comes in. Right, And you know what Paul called these? Paul called them grievous wolves that would come in. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's grievous very powerful words. Wolves. Grievous wolves. Uh, he said this, he said in Romans 16, 17 through 18, let me read this again. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they that are of such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but they serve their own belly. And by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Uh, I believe it's in the book of Jude that causes them, that tells, uh, says of those that cause divisions, grievous wolves. Um, I, I don't remember exactly where that is. But there is an illustration there that calls those who cause divisions, grievous wolves that come in in sheep's clothing. Wow. And listen, in most of the churches these days, there are those that are like a Judas. Right? And, and we don't know them. Remember, even the disciples, when Jesus says, and one of you is going to betray me this night, all of them looked around like, is it me, Lord? Is it me? None, none of them knew that it was Judas. 
So oftentimes they're in the midst of us. But listen, if there's any type of gossip that comes in from someone, cut that off right away. The Bible says avoid them. Amen. And what I like to do is, is there was actually someone that I'm not going to mention any names. But when we first started attending Lighthouse back a couple years ago, year and a half, two years ago, two years ago, there was a man that um, that I was ushering with. I'm kind of narrowing it down here. But uh, that was spreading lots of gossip. And, and, and I said, brother, I, I don't want nothing to do with this right now. I said, if you're not happy with that, you need to pray. Pray. Pray for that individual. Pray for that pastor. Pray. Well, if so and so becomes, this is when Pastor Fisher was down. If so and so becomes pastor, I, you know, I, everything's going to become ruined. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa! Please, please, please! I don't want to hear that. I come to church to love on God, to worship the Lord. I want my mind free and clear to worship God. What was that person trying to do? Cause division. Cause division. Right. Now, now that person is not wise to do that. Amen. So, you know, there's another part that says, the Bible says, mark those. Mm -hmm. Mark them and, and pray for them and, listen, rebuke them and X them out. Yeah. Amen. We don't want nothing to do with that. So, the Apostle Paul wanted his people to stand together. Amen. B, he wanted his people to strive together. He not only wanted them to stand together, he wanted them to strive together. Paul not only wanted God's people to stand together, but he wanted them to strive together. The phrase striving together in Philippians 1.27 in one word in the Greek, it means literally to wrestle in the company with. That is, figuratively speaking, to be jointly joined together. In other places in Scripture, the word translated is labored. Labored. So, we're to labor together. We're to have one mind. Amen? We are all the body of Christ. No one is greater than another. In fact, our Lord Jesus told us, if you want to be great, what are we supposed to do? Serve. Right? You want to be great? Then serve. <laughs> Amen? Yes. And, and uh, Jesus even said, He said, The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Uh, Paul wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians 4.3, He says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. I love this. The apostle Paul uh, mention certain of the women. You can read Romans 16 also. I mentioned Phoebe and so many others there. And he was complimenting them. He was loving on them. You know what breaks my heart? Is there are... Uh, I'm not trying to, you know, point on this subject of, of women. Please don't take me wrong. There are women, quote-unquote, pastors, which the Bible says, talks against, that are rising up and saying that Paul was against women. Listen, Paul was not against women. Paul loved on women. Amen. They say, well, how, how dare Paul say for, for the women to remain silent in the churches? Listen, Paul loved on women. Amen. And in fact, Paul didn't pen that. The Holy Spirit penned those words. Amen. So if you have a problem, take it up with God. Because just like the Bible says that the head of every man is who? Christ. And the head of every woman is man. That's just how God set it up. Amen? Now, are, are women less than men? Absolutely not. Amen? When God created Eve, God didn't create Eve from Adam's foot. God created Eve from Adam's rib, from his side, because she's equal to him. Amen? I know some women that are far more godly, far more powerful, far more spiritual than most men that I know. Amen. Prayer warriors. They love, love the Lord. Paul had a pastor's head, number one, but he also had a pastor's heart, number two. He had a pastor's heart. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. Besides those things which are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care for all the churches. You know what Paul was saying here in 2 Corinthians 11? He was giving a, a, a resume of his life. He was mentioning how many times he was whipped and stoned and persecuted. A day and a night I spent in the deep. And, and he mentioned so many things that happened to him, the persecutions. But he puts that all to the side and he says this. He says, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily. This was coming upon him daily that was heavy upon his heart. What was it? The care for all the churches. You know what he was saying? He was saying, 
I have, I have so much that I'm dealing with right now, being imprisoned and being stoned and being shipwrecked and having to walk hundreds and hundreds of miles and, and having to plant so many churches and disciple so many people and write all these epistles. Besides all those things that I have, I constantly have a thought on my heart and on my mind about all the churches. If they're doing well, if they're going in faith, if they're, if they're united and striving together and being a blessing together. Listen, that's if, if, if you don't think Paul was a pastor, I don't know what to tell you. That's a pastor's heart. Yeah. Amen? This man loved people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. You know what he's saying? Paul said, Though you have 10,000 teachers, you have not many fathers. You know what Paul was? Paul didn't take his position as being a pastor, church planter, missionary, uh, apostle. I don't think he took those uh, and said, oh, look at me. No, he was, he, was, he was still loving and kind. And he said uh, he, used to, he used to plead with people with tears to get saved and to give their lives to the Lord Jesus. He was a man of humility. Amen. And so many times he gave his accolades. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, remember he said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He said, concerning zeal, persecuting the church of the tribe of Benjamin. What's he doing? He's telling us, listen, yes, I have all these high accolades and I've, I've accomplished all these things. But listen, I count it all but dumb, he said. I count all that but dumb, all my accolades, all the things that I've done, I count them as dumb that I may know Christ. Amen? That I may know Him. I believe that was Philippians 2 or Philippians 3. He had made mention of that. Um, let me give you A under 2. He was a man of tears. He was a man of tears as we talked about. We see evidence of Paul's broken heartedness and deeply felt compassion for the people that he served. Remember Jesus, when He looked at the crowds, the Bible says He was moved with compassion on the crowds. He was moved with compassion. Paul had the heart of a shepherd. Paul had the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this question, class. There's something we can learn this morning is that Paul had compassion. Do you have compassion? Listen, this world is, is lost and dying and headed to hell. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 7, he says, narrow is the way that leads to life. And how many find it? Very few there be that go, that find it. And broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go by it. Do you when you when you look at your neighbors and your co-workers and your, your unsaved loved ones, are you moved with compassion? Paul would constantly cry, knowing that if those people didn't repent, there will be hell to pay for. You know, Jesus told a very, very graphic, in fact, I believe to be one of the most graphic stories in all of the Gospels about a rich man and Lazarus. You all know the story very well. I believe it's in Luke chapter 16. The Bible says that the rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. What does that mean? That means this man was royalty. And the Bible says that Lazarus was laid at his gate full of sores. And the dogs came and licked the sores. So Lazarus was so poor that he was laid at this rich man's gate. This, man, this rich man had a palace. He's not named. We just know him as rich man. The man lived for now. The man lived for the temporal, if you will. And the Bible says Lazarus, he was desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores, as the Bible says. So he was looking through the gate, he looked through the window, and he'd see this, this dining table, and he was just desiring for the crumbs that fell to the ground just to eat those crumbs. That's how poor he was. And the Bible says they both died. They both died. The Bible says Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and cried, saying, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And I don't know about you, but that's very graphic. 
And I know this with all my heart, that the Apostle Paul knew very, very well that there is an afterlife. And listen, sometimes what happens, my brothers and sisters, is that we'll go on with our everyday life, and we'll go on with work, and we'll go on with the family, we'll go on with children, and we'll forget. And we need a reminder that souls are dying by the second. As it, appoint, as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this is judgment. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15 says, And whosoever's name was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. My brothers and sisters, when you look at the crowds, when you look at people, when you look at your neighbors, when you look at your unsaved loved ones, do you have compassion upon the crowds? Do you have compassion over people? Paul was a man of tears because he knew that grievous wolves were going to come in and try to cause division in the churches. And he knew that a majority of the Jews were going to die without getting saved and giving their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a man of a broken heart. He constantly lived with a broken heart. B, he was a man of testimony. He was a man of testimony. Listen, Paul wasn't the type. Paul was Christ-like. Amen. You say, what do you mean by that? Paul didn't <laughs> point his finger at his disciples, at Timothy, at Titus, and tell them to go do certain things to Barnabas, do certain things, and I'm just going to sit back and just watch. No. Paul was on the front lines. Everything that Paul taught and everything that Paul encouraged to do, he did first. He taught on giving. He gave the most. He went all in for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what he said? He says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus in the book of Galatians. He says, he says you want to know my faith? Let me take my shirt off and show you my back. How, how, how it's all scarred. And that's, that's because of my faith and because of, of my preaching to the crowds. He was all in for the Lord. Amen. He was a man of great testimony. Let me ask you this question. How's your testimony? How's your testimony? We need to constantly work on our testimony. Listen, we can work on our testimony for many, 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 many years. And we can ruin it in just one instance. Just one instance. We can ruin it. Just one little, one little lie or one cheating or one look here at something dark and evil. We can ruin our testimony. Amen. And it takes years to build it. Let's not allow Satan or, or temptation to be able to come in and try to ruin our testimony. Paul was a man of tears. Paul was a man of testimony. And Paul was a man of tenacity. He was a man of tenacity. Tenacity can be defined as resolve, persistence, and firmness in pursuing a stated goal or end. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, he says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He calls the ministry a high calling. He calls him following the Lord Jesus Christ a high calling. You know what he's saying? It's a privilege. And it's, it, it, it's of the highest of callings. You know what he's saying? He's saying, imagine that the President of the United States gave me a task to do. Am I going to do it? half-heartedly, or am I going to do it wholeheartedly? Some of you, politically speaking, might say, well, it depends who's the president, right? But you get what I'm saying. Imagine if the Lord Jesus Christ were to show up to you and he were to tell you to go and to do something. Are you going to do it wholeheartedly, or are you going to do it half-heartedly? Paul used to do things wholeheartedly. He was a man of tenacity. He was a man of resolve. He was persistent in his ministry and his walk with the Lord, and he had firmness towards the end, till, till the end, I should say. He penned these words to Timothy, the young preacher in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. He says, Timothy, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but unto all those that love his appearing. Paul was a man of tears. He was a man of testimony. He was a man of tenacity. D, he was a man of thoroughness. He was a man of thoroughness. Paul was able to state with confidence that he had thoroughly declared all the counsel of God. And he wanted the pastors he trained to do the same. He wanted them to constantly just teach the word of God. He wrote this to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. 
And Timothy is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He was encouraging the young Timothy to, to be thorough in the word of God. Amen. Let me give you E. He was a man of teaching. Listen, Desiree knows this very well because she's a teacher. And for those of you who have taught or are teachers, most of you know that it requires a lot of patience to be a teacher. You know what it requires as well? A lot of love. Listen, throughout my years of going to school, I, I, I liked some teachers, I loved some teachers, and I couldn't stand some teachers. I could tell very, very well when a teacher's there just for the money. I can also tell when a teacher's there and they're pouring into me and loving me and spending time with me, even though I was a lovable, even though I move around a lot, amen, I was a hyper kid growing up and, and oftentimes I wasn't lovable, I'd constantly be rebellious or disobedient growing up, but I could always tell when a teacher would come alongside of me like a father and say, Carlo, we shouldn't do it this way, let's do it this way. That's okay, you messed up, that's okay. Let's go back and let's read that one more time. You know what that requires? Patience. You know what that teacher was doing? That teacher was loving on me. That teacher actually cared for me, amen? Instead of saying, you know what? There's just no future in this one. I'm just gonna move on. You know what the Apostle Paul did? As the Apostle Paul looked at people, he saw potential in everyone. I love that, amen? Listen, he didn't look at the cup as half empty. He looked at the cup as half, half full, always. Amen? He always looked at the positive of everything. Listen, he was in prison. He was in jail. He was underground in the worst conditions of his life. He wrote down to the Philippian church and said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Paul was constantly looking at people and he constantly saw potential. Even if they were, even no matter what kind of old life or what kind of lifestyle they had. He saw potential in them. This person can get saved. If this person would just give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, I know that God would completely transform their life. And Paul loved on people. All kinds of people. Paul loved on kings. Amen. Remember when he stood before Agrippa? And remember when he stood before, uh, who else was that? Was that Herod? He stood before so many kings and so many, so many uh, high officials. And listen, many of them gave their lives to Jesus because of him. Remember the Philippian jailer when him and Silas were there in prison and the Bible says that they sang and there was an earthquake and what happened to that Philippian jailer? He gave his life to the Lord. And then that Philippian jailer said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? They gave him the gospel. They shared the love of God with him. They got, he got saved. And then he takes them over to his house, cleans their wounds, and the Bible says that that Philippian jailer's household got saved. Paul had an amazing testimony. Amen. He had a pastor's head. Uh, he, he was a man of tears. He was a man of testimony. He was a man of tenacity. He was a man of thoroughness. He was a man of teaching. Number three, he had pastor's hands. He had pastor's hands. What do you mean? He was constantly working. working. Constantly working. He wasn't lazy. Amen. He was constantly a man that would, would be busy for the work of the Lord. Paul had a pastor's head. He had a pastor's heart. And he had pastor's hands. There's a time to think, a time to feel. And a time to work with your hands and get busy. Amen. That was the Apostle Paul. Uh, that's number three. Under, under number three, A, he was willing to lead. He was willing. Remember how the, uh, how the Apostle Peter said, not by constraint, but willingly. Right? Not by constraint. Don't do it because you have to do it. Do it because, you have a, because you're willing to do it. Because you want to do it. Paul was willing wholeheartedly to lead. Uh, let me give you 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul's telling Timothy, Timothy, you've seen my testimony. You've seen my walk of life. You've seen how I've been willing to lead. I want you to do the same. Amen. There's a lot we can learn from the Apostle Paul. Uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. He was constantly willing to lead. He led Barnabas. He led Timothy. He led Titus. He led so, so, so many people. Let me give you B. 
He was not only willing to lead, but he was willing to labor. He was willing to roll up his sleeves and get busy for the work of the Lord. Amen. He was willing to labor. It's almost tiring just to read of the travels and of the labors of the Apostle Paul. Read, for instance, Acts chapter 16 and Acts chapter 18 and notice the demanding schedule and diligent labors of the Apostle Paul. Remember, back in those days, there was no buses, there were no trains, there was no cars, there were no airplanes. This was a walking, laboring man. You know what Jesus said? Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. You know what Jesus was saying? Jesus was saying, I'm a laboring man. I'm a man's man. I get busy for the work of the Lord. Jesus said this. He said, he said I must be about my father's business. Are you about your father's business mm -hmm. this morning? Mm -hmm. If not, why not? Amen. If not, this morning's a good time for us to repent, get right with God, and say, Lord, some of the attributes that the Apostle Paul had, you spoke to me this morning about them. I don't have compassion over the crowds like I should. I don't have, a, I don't have patience. Uh, I don't have a, a kindness. I don't, uh, I don't uh, shed tears over the churches or over people like I should. Father, will you please give me a compassionate heart? Will you please help me with a willing mind to be able to lead and to, and to, and to love on people? The Bible says this in Acts 28, verse 30 through 31, speaking about laboring. And Paul dwelt two years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. He never pushed anybody away. Anytime somebody wanted to come to him, he would receive them and love on them and train them and talk to them about the Lord. And what was he doing? He was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love this part. With all confidence. Yeah. No man for, forbidding him. Conclusion. We got through it. Amen. Paul exercised a pastor's head, heart, and hands. He promoted unity in the churches that he planted. He exhibited pastoral care for the pastors he trained and the churches he planted. And he labored abundantly for the gospel's sake. My brothers and sisters, do you strive together in unity with other Christians? Are you leading and teaching the people God has placed in your life with patience and love? Consider how you can use your head, use your heart, and use your hands in the ministry where God has placed you. Amen. Father, thank you so very much for this lesson on the Apostle Paul. We ask, Lord, that you'd please bless us. Help us in Jesus' name to be able to take some of these attributes of the Apostle Paul, of the Lord Jesus, and apply them to our lives. Father, help us to have unity in the churches. Help us to have compassion over those who are lost and, and over, over our brethren. Help us, Father, to lead and to, and to work and to roll up our sleeves and say, Lord, use me wherever you see fit. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for first loving us. Thank you for giving your life for us. Thank you for promising us. Thank you that you cannot lie. I love that verse in Titus chapter 1, verse 2. That you have promised us eternal life and that you cannot lie. And we're going to hold on to your promises. Lord, please bless the service to come. Bless Pastor Hetzer as he's getting ready to teach us the word of God. Thank you so much for feeding us, Lord, of your word. We love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Brother Dan.